Brian Stevenson, we're at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. Your book is Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption. First of all, welcome. Thank you. Delighted to be here. So you are also the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative. You're a professor at the New York University School of Law. Um, but if you would, um, it would be great to hear about um, how you first began this journey of thinking about justice in America. Yeah. Well, I actually grew up in a poor rural community where the schools were still segregated when I started my education. So I started uh, my education in a colored school, and lawyers came into the community and made them open up the public schools for black children. And I didn't appreciate it then, but it kind of planted this idea that lawyers were people who had power to change things, even though I never really thought much about being a lawyer. Uh, when I graduated from college with a degree in philosophy, I realized nobody was going to pay me to philosophize, and so I started looking around for ways to kind of find meaningful ways to spend time and ended up in law school like a lot of people. But I have to say I really didn't like it. Uh, I was there to, to kind of focus on race, racial issues and poverty and justice and it didn't sound like anybody was talking about race or poverty and justice and it was really only in the middle of my law school uh, career that I had an opportunity to take an insurance that sent me to the Deep South uh, where I met people on death row. And these were folks literally dying for legal assistance, uh, condemned people who had no money, who had no lawyers, whose cases really reflected some really troubling truths about the American criminal justice system. I think we have a system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. It's a system that presumes the guilt of black and brown people. It's a system that's been compromised by politics and that tolerates a lot of unreliability. And the idea that these people were going to be killed uh, when those kinds of questions were so resonant really jarred me and I immediately knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to stand with condemned people uh, who were facing execution in a system I thought was unjust, unfair, and terribly unreliable. You start the, at the center of your story which leads into a lot of conversation obviously about justice and racial equality in the United States is, is, is Walter McMillan. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about who he is. Yeah, so um, Mr. McMillan was an African-American man in Monroeville, Alabama, who was accused of committing a murder uh, in, the, in the 1980s. Uh, it was a terrible crime that took place in downtown Monroeville when a young white woman was murdered at a dry cleaning store. And the police couldn't solve the crime. Six months later, there's a lot of pressure on them uh, to solve it, and they couldn't. And we believe they targeted Mr. McMillan not because he had a prior crime history, he had never been in trouble before, but we believe they targeted him because he was an African-American man having an affair with a young white woman. And uh, even though at the time of the crime he was with uh, his family and about 20 other people raising money for his sister's church 11 miles away, they persisted in prosecuting, prosecuting him for this murder he clearly didn't commit. It was a case filled with ironies. Uh, when I met him, uh, it was clear that he was innocent. Uh, it was clear that people were just ignoring all of this evidence. But it was also clear that this community was very disconnected. Uh, this community, Monroeville, Alabama, is actually where Harper Lee grew up and wrote the very beloved American novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. Yeah. And if you go to Monroeville, you see evidence of that everywhere. They love that story. They put on plays about it each year. All the streets are named after characters. In the book, there's a, you know, a Boo Radley deli. You can get an Atticus milkshake. I mean, they just love the story. And yet, we're con completely indifferent to the plight of this innocent black man uh, facing execution. Uh, they put him on death row for 15 months before the trial, almost to create uh, an identity for him that he is super dangerous. Uh, the trial lasted a day and a half. Uh, the jury convicted him of murder. Uh, the judge, whose name was Robert E. Lee Key, overrode the jury's verdict of life and imposed the death penalty in our state. About 25% of the people on death row got life verdicts from juries that our elected judges can override. And then they sent him back to death row. Uh, and that really, just all of that, really challenged me when I met him. Uh, there was a despair in the poor and minority community that was also deeply troubling to me because people were with him when the crime took place and they knew he was innocent. Right. They felt his conviction in a very personal way. They would say, Mr. Stevenson, it would have been so much better if he'd been out in the woods hunting by himself when the crime took place, because at least then we could entertain the possibility that he might be guilty. But because we were there with him, we feel like we've been convicted too. We feel like we've been sentenced to death too. And the hopelessness was tangible. 
And so working on that case for me uh, was not just working uh, to free an innocent man, but it was also working to change a narrative that emerged in that community that even though we talk about justice, even though we talk about race and we talk about all these things, we don't do anything that has actually made it any safer uh, for poor and people of color. One of the most uh, compelling elements of that story for me, of the Walter McMillan story, is that you learn about this man, his life, and you actually learn his story. And that requires a level of empathy mm -hmm. to understand a person's story, a person's background, a person's history, and take that into consideration when we think about justice. Yeah. What do you think in terms of the United States and, and our sense of empathy and our sense of justice? What's happened to that over the course of the last century? Yeah, no, I think it's really critical. I don't think you can effectively advocate for people you do not understand. And, and it's when we get closer to people that we really understand who they are and what their lives are about. And I don't think that our country has done a good job of owning up to the ways in which it has created anguish and pain and suffering and marginality. Uh, with a kind of thoughtful engagement about the people. Why is that? You know, I think it's because uh, we um, have developed some really bad habits uh, dating back to the time of slavery. I mean, you know, for me, uh, the great evil of American slavery was not involuntary servitude. It was the narrative of racial difference that we created. We've always wanted to feel good about who we are. We've always wanted to be proud. And we'll deny certain truths if it complicates our feeling of being good mm -hmm. or being proud. And uh, you know, the great difference between America's slavery and the rest of the world, most countries had slavery during a period of their history, but they were mostly societies with slaves. We became a slave society. We wanted slave owners uh, to feel good about the fact that they were owning other human beings. So we created this narrative that black people were different, not fully human, not as smart as, not as hardworking as. And that narrative of racial difference, that ideology of white, white supremacy, was to me the great evil of American slavery. And we did it so that people could feel Christian and moral and just, even while they owned other human beings. But it's why I don't believe that slavery ended in 1865. I think it just evolved. And we've never confronted that narrative. And so we had decades of lynching and terrorism. Uh, we had segregation. And even the civil rights movement has become too celebratory. We don't talk about the resistance. And that's left us vulnerable uh, to cases like Walter McMillan, where we presume the dangerousness and guilt of black and brown people. And you see it today uh, with the shootings of these unarmed men by police officers. You see it uh, when people of color feel threatened and menaced and harassed. You see it in the way our system functions. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had 152 people uh, exonerated that is proved innocent after being sentenced to death. And almost all of them are poor they're disproportionately black and brown. And it's because we apply this presumption of dangerousness and guilt uh, to black and brown people. And that's, that's the challenge I think we face in this country. Unlike other societies, we've never made truth telling about our mistakes a priority. We didn't have truth and reconciliation after the civil rights movement. Uh, we haven't done what Germany is doing around the Holocaust. We, uh, if you go to Germany, you're, you're, you see markers and monuments everywhere marking the spaces where Jewish families were abducted mm -hmm. and taken to the concentration camps. And they want you to go to the camps and reflect soberly on the history of the Holocaust. We want the opposite. We don't like talking about race. We don't like talking about slavery. We don't like talking about lynching or segregation or the exploitation of Native people. And because of that, we remain vulnerable in our criminal justice system to replicating these dynamics of racial bias and discrimination against the poor and abusing power uh, that have too often corrupted the way our society functions. And so I think working in the criminal justice system gives you an opportunity to push against that resistance, the arrogance of never having to say, I'm sorry, uh, the consciousness that comes when you're kind of reflecting on the ways you, you failed. And that was the great challenge of the McMillan case, was getting a community to recognize that they had made a mistake, that they were wrong getting past the arrogance and the ego uh, and the resistance to acknowledging uh, the fallibility of a system that is very, very compromised. I think there's a lot of people that think, well, come on, that was, you know, the 1960s or that was the 1860s, uh, you know, but the point is, like, they think that that's enough time mm -hmm. for everyone to have gotten mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. Your answer to somebody who thinks that, you know, it's time to look forward, not mm -hmm. backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think we never dealt with what we were dealing with in the 1860s. We never talked honestly about slavery. We've never dealt with lynching. We've never dealt with the real ugliness. You know, when we talk about civil rights in this country, we tend to be very celebratory. We talk about the heroic acts of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, but the real story of the civil rights era was the resistance 
of millions of people who did not want racial integration. And we haven't talked about that. And so the reason why it's not in the distant past is because it's still this big open wound that we have failed to treat. And it manifests itself day in and day out. People are really upset in this country right now about the plight of these young men who, who are being shot by police. We're upset. The Bureau of Justice now projects that one in three black male babies is expected to go to jail or prison during his lifetime. That's not all about their mistakes. That's also about the way in which we manage these problems. Um, and we say in this country that saying I'm a proud American is a necessary precondition to everything. And we haven't complicated that narrative in the ways I think we have to. If you come to the Deep South, we love to celebrate mid-19th century history. We talk about the Confederacy like it was the grand, glorious era. Mm -hmm. uh, Jefferson Davis's birthday is a state holiday in Alabama. Uh, okay. Confederate Memorial Day is a state holiday. And we don't even have Martin Luther King Day. We have Martin Luther King slash Robert E. Lee Day. And so that false notion of pride is actually a barrier to confronting some of these challenges. And they live with us. We are not, they're not invisible. They are all around us. I mean, I've been practicing law for 30 years. I've argued five cases at the Supreme Court. I have my so-called degree. I mean, I, I, it's not a so-called degree. I have a degree. It's from a real one. It's a real degree <laughs> yeah. from Harvard Law School. And yet, I was sitting in a courtroom just two years ago getting ready to do a hearing, and I was at defense counsel's table with my suit and tie on, and the judge walked out, and he saw me sitting there, and he said, hey, 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 you get back out there in the hallway, and you wait until your lawyer gets here. I don't want any defendant sitting in my courtroom without their lawyer. And I stood up and said, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Uh, my name is Brian Stevenson. I am the lawyer. And the judge started laughing, and the prosecutor started laughing. And I made myself laugh because I didn't want to disadvantage my client. Uh, but afterward, I was thinking, what is it uh, about uh, this place that when a judge sees a middle-aged black man in a suit and tie at counsel table, it doesn't occur to him, that's the lawyer. And whatever it is, do I think it's going to disadvantage defendants of color when they're being sentenced? Yes. Do I think it's going to influence the way that judge hears the testimony of black and minority witnesses? Yes. Do I think it's going to shape the way he values the victimization of people of color? Yes. And that kind of bias is everywhere. Uh, and we have been corrupted, in my judgment, uh, by our failure, our silence in confronting our history of racial inequality. And many of the people I write about in the book are the victims of that silence. They're the victims of our failure to show some humility to acknowledge our uh, inability to get past our biases. I don't think the death penalty in America is an issue that's shaped by whether people, uh, that, that you can answer by asking the question, do people deserve to die for the crimes they've committed? I think you have to ask the question, do we deserve to kill? And where you have a system that has failed to do better in eliminating racial bias, eliminating bias against the poor, eliminating the political effects, eliminating abuse of power, we don't deserve to kill. And in many ways, uh, I'm, I wrote this book because I'm persuaded that if people saw what I see on a regular basis, they would demand change. They would want change. They would not support uh, what goes on in the name of justice. So can you change minds, or do you, are, you, are you banging the drum for the next generation that's now formulating opinions? And we seem so intractable in some of our opinions at this point. Are you writing this book for the converted and their children? And the next generation of children, are you trying to change people's minds? No, I really want to change people's minds. I mean, I, we're doing a lot of work now um, that's kind of designed to engage people in conversation. Um, you know, I write about people who initially, when they confront me, uh, are pretty hostile, uh, who carry that narrative of racial difference in the way that they interact with me. Uh, but through our time together, I see real change, real progress. I think you have to be hopeful about what you can do. Uh, I'm not interested in talking to people who are already where I think they need to be on these issues. I want to talk to people who aren't there. And uh, we've had some success with that in our casework, uh, in our litigation, in our advocacy, uh, but not nearly as much. I think things are intractable only because we haven't struggled very much to shake them up. I mean, we're a society that we talk in the, in the margins a little bit about these issues, but we haven't really engaged in a meaningful way. We've got a project where we're trying to put markers and monuments at all the slave trading spaces in America. I want to put markers and monuments at all the lynching sites in this country. And that will be challenging and it will create a little controversy, but I think that's a healthy start to a conversation we need to have. Um, and so for me, yeah, it's a time of, of uh, real challenge, 
but a time of great opportunity. I think we're in a place where if we're diligent, uh, we can really uh, create a new generation that gets beyond some of these issues. Well, this book is a great start as well. Just Thank Mercy. You. Brian Stevenson, thanks so much for joining us here today. It's a wonderful book. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too.